Ew, gotta get rid of this old Backstreet Boys t-shirt. Tell me why. Because it stinks, boys. Tell me why. I've washed it so many times, but the odor won't come out. Tell me why. No, you tell me why I can't get rid of this odor. Have you tried Downy Rinse and Refresh? It doesn't just cover up odors. It helps remove them. Wow, it worked, guys. Yeah. Downy Rinse and Refresh removes more odor in one wash than the leading value detergent in three washes. Find it wherever you buy laundry products. Why don't more infant formula companies use organic, grass-fed whole milk instead of skim? Why don't more infant formula companies use the latest breast milk science? Why don't more infant formula companies run their own clinical trials? Why don't more infant formula companies use more of the proteins found in breast milk? Why don't more infant formula companies have their own factories instead of outsourcing their manufacturing? We wondered the same thing. So we made Byheart, an infant formula company on a mission to get a lot closer to the most super, super food on the planet, breast milk. Our patented protein blend has more of the important and most abundant proteins actually found in breast milk. We're the first and only U.S.-made formula to use organic, grass-fed whole milk, not skim. We even conducted the largest clinical trial by a new infant formula company in a quarter century with clinically proven benefits like easier digestion, less spit-up, and softer poops versus a leading infant formula. And we make our own formula in the USA and our very own factories in Iowa, Oregon, and Pennsylvania. Byheart, a better formula for formula. Learn more at byheart.com. Welcome to Spotcast. This is season three, episode three. And well, my name is Tim Mitchell and I am in Toronto, Ontario. And I'm joined once again by Jonathan Kuline and Mr. Mississauga. Hello there. And we have Jaime Lopez Jr. on the line <laughs> in Seattle, Washington. How's it going? Yeah, I'm laughing because Mark said, you didn't say on the line last night. <laughs> yeah. Anyway. All right. So we start off with some fact check. Um, Kess was the person I was trying to remember the name of. You know, the sort of, I think Jonathan's least favorite character on Voyager. I'm not oh. mistaken. By a, by a good distance, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So she, at one point, uh, one of these little, you know, ethereal beings came and impregnated her. And because didn't she like eight, like she, she aged like real fast or something like that? Like she was like pretty much a kid or an adolescent when the show started. And like within a season, she was like a seasoned adult and then had to go off and live a life somewhere else or something like that. Yeah, well, they, they basically, they did the butterfly metaphor with her, right? She was supposed to be like, you know, her current state is her, you know, larval phase and then she she goes off and explores the galaxy as a butterfly, which is a nice way of saying you're not working out, get off the show. Yeah, which is kind of how it reads, right? Oh, it's 100% you know? what happened. They, she did not test yeah. well, and they were like, you know what we need? A really sexy Borg. Yeah. Well, did, did Seven come in in season two or three? Season or three, whatever? she replaced Cass. Oh, really? That quickly? Okay, yeah. Yeah. Definitely, definitely, a def- even even notwithstanding the cat suits, um, you know, definitely a much better character, right? And better actress, I guess, right? More dynamic. Yeah. As we all know. Anywho. Um, moving on. All right. So the next piece of fact check here was uh, we were, I was talking about the journey to Babel, which was the or Babel was the um, potato potato uh, episode from Star Trek, where we were introduced to the uh, second inter- second episode where we were introduced to the actor Mark Leonard. He played a uh, I believe he played a Romulan mm-hmm. commander yep. previously or or unknown. Nope. I guess yeah, Romulan. Romulan. Yeah. Yeah. So, but he he played Ambassador Sarek, and anybody who knows anything about Star Trek, he you know was in many many shows after that still trying not to spoil it um after after 40 years or however long it's been 50 years i guess right how long has it been it's been over 50 years since the original show's debut yeah. disney's mulan which is coming out on the disney plus channel in canada is 34.99 uh to watch that one carol was saying that you had to pay for for Hamilton as well, or did was that not? No, Hamilton's included. Yeah, that was included in the United States as well. I don't know if there was charges elsewhere. Um, no, not, I mean not planets. here, anyways. Yeah, yeah. Not like not like you're doing in Milan. Right? No, no, no. They, they need to recoup the theatrical box that they're not going to get, right? No, Hamilton was about a lost leader. They basically put it up hoping more people would subscribe, and I'm sure it worked. But all the cineplexes are open now, aren't they? Like you can go see movies. Yeah, but there are no new movies. There are only existing movies. The new movies are next week is when the new movies start dropping. Tenets and a couple other movies are starting to pop up in theaters starting next week. Right. Okay. Yeah. And then, I mean, the United States is one of the largest markets for that sort of thing. And we're in a world of hurt and it's 
doesn't make sense uh, to release something like a Mulan in, in theaters, or at least only in theaters. I think that's why they went to streaming on that. And if people are wondering, well, hey, well, how come Hamilton was free and Mulan wasn't? It's like, well, I mean, I'm sure there was, you know, a good budget for Hamilton, um, but it's not uh, an enormous budget like there almost certainly was for Mulan. Yeah, I think they said it was $200 million to make Mulan. So that's, they got to make that back a little bit anyways. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Right. And I have a fact check as well. The uh, We were talking about Doctor Who and we were trying to, uh, we were talking about when David Eccleston, no, Christopher Eccleston, Christopher Eccleston uh, was, was, uh, was the new Doctor for the first time and you had said 10 years ago, but it was actually 2005. So 10 seasons, but 15 years. Oh, 10 seasons. Oh, really? Yeah, because there was just gap. There was gaps and stuff in, in the time. They didn't do every year because they moved some seasons around and stuff like that. So it's actually, they've done 10 series over... Oh, the 10th series. Okay. Yeah, so they've done 10 or ten or 11 series since they rebooted, but it was 2005 was when they rebooted. That one tweaked my memory because that first uh, box set that I got and then you watched and then you said, this is great, you should watch this, came from my friend Rick, who I worked with at Metro, and that was back in 2005. Left there in Actually, you know what? I don't think I ever opened the box set. Did I open the box set? I think so. I thought I watched it on Space. So I, yeah, I think I had already been watching it. Yeah. Hmm. Well, there you go. Yeah, because it's Doctor Who. Come on. You know, it's like like there's new Star Trek on. We're going to watch it, right? Uh, it you, you had to work a lot harder than that to get me to watch Doctor Who because I had only ever seen like the really bad 1970s Doctor Who and I was not on board until you were like, no, no, really, it's good. Yeah. yeah. Well, so we had the same discussion about Battletoad Galactica. That's really. true. You're absolutely right. And you were right about that too. Yeah. Because I used to watch it back in the 70s. It was painful. Uh, but Lauren Green, man. I mean, really. No, well, he was Was he in the TV show? Yeah. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah, he was a Dama. Uh, yeah, I know he was a Dama, but I, I remember him. I never saw the actual theatrical movie. I don't think I, maybe I should go back and watch it. I never did actually. I've got a copy here on DVD waiting for you, pal. DVD? Wow. Yeah, DVD. You know, that's funny. Did Xavier tell you the other day we were trying to watch a Blu ray and we couldn't figure out, like, I had unplugged the HDMI cable and then it, this this Blu ray, I got a 4K Blu ray player from my friend who just gave it to me, right? No manual, nothing like that. And it's got two HDMIs on the back. One's for a subwoofer, one's for the for the actual oh, for the TV. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and I couldn't see when I plugged it in. I just sort of like, I plugged in what I thought was the right one and we're trying to figure out why we can't see any picture and it turned out i plugged it into the subwoofer right that, so, yeah so apparently there's a hdmi subwoofer feed for some reason no. who knows who knows anyway so let's get on to the headlines we got how many is up first i think right mm-hmm. apparently the dc universe original shows are heading to hbo max so it seems to be uh, maybe fallout of the reorganization that jonathan talked about last week so it's, it's almost like follow-up in that case Right, then it is headlines of uh, what's going on. We don't do follow up in this show, we do headlines. Yeah, I'm like, oh, it's like getting me confused. Um, but yeah, I guess it, it kind of makes sense. You know, we've seen this proliferation of streaming services but i think you know as as time goes on we'll probably start seeing some consolidation because it's it's a little harder to have you know a more niche service like was was dc universe actually the name of the of the service or is that what they were calling their uh, their cinematic universe no that's what they were calling the app uh it's just called dc universe supposed to be everything dc in one one stop so you can get your comics you can get your tv shows you can get your movies you can get uh there's an exclusive toy shop on the app um, uh, of course, it never was available here in Canada, so I only ever heard this anecdotally, but uh, that was what it was supposed to be, is sort of the one stop for everybody who loved everything DC Universe. Yeah, well, we get the, we get this on space and things like that and showcase, and because we get Doom Patrol and as pictured here in the link, right? Yeah. Uh, we get that regular on regular TV or streaming TV. But the difference between what happens in America and what happens here is here we get it with a regular cable service, but uh, it's piecemeal. We get stuff that's spread all over the place. So you don't you have to really go hunting to figure out like oh okay this channel's got Doom Patrol that channel's got um, Harley Quinn this channel's got this this channel's got that like it's it's not like a one stop shop you kind of have to go figure out who who bought the streaming rights here yeah yeah but like but the, but different like we have the we have the H- we have Crave which is basically the equivalent of our uh, it used to be TMO go right um, yeah it was T- which yeah, is the equivalent of movie HBO, network yeah right? yeah yeah so um, but like I'm saying like we're not we don't have to pay to watch Doom Patrol and yeah which you would have 
have to pay in the states if you're on HBO Max, right? Right. Previously, as they state here in the article, um, you know, seven ninety nine a month for DC Universe, which is more than than just the streaming part. It, I, that does remind me that it was you know access to the comic. We books. have to pay additional on top of HBO Max. Yes. Yeah. What? So again, this is part of the the whole thing where people are trying out different models of like, well, you know, will this stand alone on its own? Maybe not, but can it be an addition onto this other thing that people like? Right. There's all these different services that are trying to figure out, you know, what does the business model look like? And it seems like, you know, if, if DC was having sort of general issues, like, all right, well, let's make these shows available on HBO Max. It, you know, it might be prudent to do so rather than trying to maintain that as a separate business line. Well, it brings them more in line with something like Disney Plus, because Disney Plus is the Disney content. It's some of the Fox content. It's some of the Marvel content. It's Pixar. It's all these different things, National Geographic, all in one, one stop. But it's all uh, sort of PG-13 and and younger skewed, whereas HBO Max is going to have, in theory, they're going to have the Warner Brothers catalog, they're going to have the HBO catalog, they're going to have the DC catalog, including all the cartoons and TV shows and all that kind of stuff. If they moved it all into one spot, that would actually be uh, a pretty impressive amount of things to have in one spot, as long as they are uh, they were consistent in what they had available. So it, it does make sense, although, again, it's, it's not apples to apples, because you'd be talking about if Disney Plus is the sort of young younger skewing version and Hulu is the older skewing version. HBO Max would be the sort of one-stop shop, but then you also have to worry about your kids watching, uh, you know, Oz instead of watching Batman Brave and the Bold. Well, to, pig- to piggyback on that, um, I have a follow-up about this as well, and last week as we were uh, talking about the, the changes that happened to DC Comics proper, where they had slashed a bunch of jobs and reorganized, and one of the things I speculated was, are we going to see that fallout hit the editorial side? Are they going to cancel books? Are they going to do things? Well, in a big shocking turn of events, this week we started seeing some axes fall on some of their uh, titles. So really? wow. we had already gotten news that Batgirl, Batman and the Outsiders, Justice League Odyssey were all going to be ending in October. This week we got news that Teen Titans, Young Justice, Suicide Squad, Hawkman, John Constantine Hellblazer are all going to be ended in November. And uh, there's also a rumor that I don't know if it's been confirmed in the last couple of days that Aquaman is also going to be canceled because the writer of that is leaving so they think that that might be the end of the run as well and there was another couple of mini series you said no aquaman Aquaman, okay. And um, you mentioned Batman earlier, right? Oh. Uh, Batgirl, oh, Batman and the Outsiders. Batman and the Outsiders. That's a spinoff series. That's um, yeah, that's a, a secondary title. They haven't canceled. They haven't canceled any of the tentpole titles. You can make the argument they haven't canceled the Justice League. They haven't canceled Batman, Superman, Action Comics, Detective, Wonder Woman. Uh, some of those household names. But Teen Titans is not a nothing book. Nor is Suicide Squad. Nor is Hellblazer. Nor is Aquaman. Like these aren't. This is not you know nothing we're talking about 10 titles 10 titles canceled in two months so uh if we were looking for a fallout that might see some changes happening there i think that's the first first salvo i guess we'll see if there's more to come or or what the future holds uh usually when they start hacking titles it's usually followed up by but hey we're going to start this new title or we're going to do something exciting over here there was no real that it was just was just the slashing this week so so where do they go like if they're not going to be like could they come back and some by somebody can somebody else pick them up and publish them, no or? they own the license for the characters that they're their characters they have the intellectual rights so as long as they want to keep them on the shelf they'll stay on the shelf uh they can restart them at any time they can restart them from where they left off or they could restart them from a new number one they could amalgamate different characters into different titles sometimes they'll do that they'll be like oh the you know aquaman isn't going to be in his own title this month but he's going to guest star in the you know for the next six months in justice league or something so there's lots of ways to go to keep the characters alive even if they don't have their own books but it's also they cancel these for a reason the reason is that they're not selling well and if they're not selling well is that a, is that a reflection of the quality of the books is it a reflection on how they're marketing is it a reflection of hey that was somebody's pet project and now that person has been let go so we can let go of the title there's there's obviously lots of possibilities for why this kind of thing happens but um but still it's kind of uh it's disheartening to to see that level of uh you know first the the cutting of staff and now the cutting of titles it, it does not bode well all right next one we got goes really full on 
Christopher Plummer re- replacing Kevin Spacey in <laughs> I don't remember which Netflix movie it was when Kevin Spacey had his uh, his allegations come to light. I think it was something to do with um, it was the, the um, Getty thing, wasn't it? The Getty thing, yeah, the Getty movie, yeah. not the TV show. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah in a very similar vein, um, there is the uh, the zombie movie Army of Dead or Army of the Dead, I should say, that was being directed by Zack Snyder. Uh, they're getting uh, a casting change. So Chris Delia, the um, stand-up comedian, was was part of that uh, as a star. And uh, he's had some uh, some accusations, some very serious accusations of sexual assault coming out. And um, uh, apparently they are doing reshoots with Tig Notaro, you know, Jet Reno from Star Trek Discovery, taking place. And they're going to do reshoots and some CGI work is to get that in there. So that's... I guess, yeah. Yeah, I'm like, wow, that's <laughs> uh, that's pretty interesting that the, that they're doing that. Yeah. It, they are pretty interchangeable, yeah. I felt a little weird because the accusations against uh, Chris came out and the next day I was watching Netflix and if you leave your Netflix off, uh, if, you don't, if you're not actually using it, it, it cuts to showing prom- promotional stuff or uh, things that you might be interested in. And uh, they were still promoting very active up on their title screens. Oh, watch our new Chris D'Elia comedy special. I was like, uh, the timing of that feels a little awkward. You might want to, you might want to just tone that down a little bit till these allegations are settled one way or the other. And uh, and yeah, now obviously we're seeing you know some of the some of the cancel culture stuff coming in. You know, the, Chris was accused of some very serious stuff, as as Jaime said, but nothing's been proven in a court. Nothing, you know, like these are allegations. And you know, uh, while I by no means condone what he's accused of i do think that uh you know these these things are dealt with very harshly in the in the court of public opinion so if it was going to detract from their movie you can see why they'd make that move but it's also pretty uh pretty severe but chris Daly is the guy from the whitney show right yep was, yep okay yeah because the, the picture of the guy they have on the on the, the post here is definitely not him so i guess it's a different person yeah he's probably a secondary ben character badgley guy? ben badgley um, yeah I don't, I don't know who he is or the new kid i don't know yeah. anyway at least at least i know who at least i'm correct knowing who Chris Delia is. All righty, next up. Honey. Next one, I, I'm pretty sure this is Christopher Plummer as well as I'm looking at the at the uh, the, the album art here for Peacock's <laughs> Departure, which is apparently a, a new show that NBC is coming out with on their, their Peacock streaming service, which, as this article talks about, you know, continues NBC's obsession with disappearing planes as they've had um, Lost as a series, uh, Manifest, which is, is ongoing, and this is Departure, which... Um, from you know, from the the appearances here, it seems to be a bit more of a, of a more straightforward and grounded, no pun intended, uh, approach to to the the topic. Uh, it seems like there won't be quite as much of a uh, magical uh, aspect to it, or or mysterious alien aspect to it. What would be more like, all right, well, uh, seems like you know maybe terrorism or weather or other sort of more normal things have occurred. Uh, but I just brought it up because you know streaming services were collecting them all and uh, Christopher Palmer's face. I'm like, oh, that goes really well with the previous topic <laughs> well maybe they fly around like you know in these circle airports looking for a pandemic less place to land <laughs> just <laughs> coasting on fumes yeah can't land there there's too much pandemic going on down there just a quick real-time follow-up lost was abc that was disney oh was it okay yeah 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 it just you mentioned lost and i was like lost was nbc it just got my brain rolling over i'm like that didn't sound right so i looked it up and yeah it's that was disney wow you remember that far into the past <laughs> I, I i was a lost I was a lost fan until the last season, and then I wasn't. Then I wasn't as big a fan, but I really did enjoy the first five seasons. Yeah, I watched the first one, but then I kind of lost interest. I got lost, lost and lost. Alrighty, and next up we have this one. I thought was was kind of interesting. From a uh, people are are having to adapt to the new way that things are going on. So this article is about um, four cities in the state of Indiana that are suing Netflix, Hulu, Disney Plus, claiming that those services owe cable franchise fees. So for folks who don't know, um, there is often a thing like a cable provider will have where they'll have to pay a franchise fee for the uh, the right of way um, from the city because, you know, for that cable technology, you have basically just like enforced monopolies like very much on purpose because you don't want you know the streets being torn up every week as like yet another provider is trying to lay down um the cabling right so it kind of makes sense that all right you know this will be a tighter regulation thing and oh by the way um as part of the business deal of of allowing you you know in the state that's probably going to be comcast or whatever time warner became spectrum i think 
as the provider and they'll be paying these franchise fees. Well, so what happens when the demographics change and people's usage changes and like, well, now we don't have as many people paying for cable or cutting the cord and say, cool, I'm going to get, you know, any one of these streaming services. I can see where we're, you know, starting here for these four cities in Indiana, they were probably like, hey, we kind of need <laughs> to, to deal with that shortfall in revenue. Cool. Let's see if we can find some sort of legal way in which these services fall under our jurisdiction for these franchise fees. I think this is one to keep a watch on, not only for precedence, but will there be other things going on in other cities around the United States, and then project towards, well, what it happens around the world. Because I'm aware of, of similar-ish kinds of things like TV taxes or license or something that you pay for in the United Kingdom. You know, it helps pay for things like the BBC channel. I think I've seen things in other other parts of either Europe or maybe it was over in Asia where, you know, you would pay a similar thing of like, hey, if you have a TV, you end up paying a fee. And they said, oh, well, now if you have a computer, uh, you pay a fee for that because so many people were not even having a TV and just watching on their computer monitor. Gotcha. Yeah. Weird. Yeah. And, and I don't know if this has happened over there in Canada, but another thing that's come up here in the States is, you know, traditionally you end up with a lot of taxation, uh, a lot of folks call it a vice tax or tobacco related to smoking. Well, as there are fewer and fewer smokers, we've seen a large increase in correlation in people vaping. So there are states and cities that said, hmm, well, it sucks that we're losing this this tax revenue because there's fewer people smoking. So maybe vaping falls under our particular rules. And, and it's still kind of uh, out there as like, will this be a thing? Uh, what's the, the legal ramifications? So I think this is one to watch to see, you know, would there end up being uh, fees that presumably would be passed along to us as the the streaming service subscribers or will this you know cause some uh you know just a lot of teeth gnashing and 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 nothing who knows yeah we do have we do have sin taxes here we call them unofficially but i don't know if vaping that's an interesting angle though you hadn't really thought about that but yeah that's the kind of thing canada would do they would start taxing the vaping as well i'm, not, I'm sure they would do that yeah and and in a less you know sin taxi sort of way here in uh, the state of washington where i live uh, there was a, a gas tax that they ended up you know wanting to add a much larger tax partially for you know, environmental reasons, try to get people over to renewable energy sources, get them off to electric vehicles. But the flip side of that was like, oh, well, we were a little too successful. And now there's a huge drop in the amount of revenue they were getting from the gas tax. Like, oh, no, there's too many people doing uh, electric vehicles. There's too many people using the bus. Like, what are we doing? Like, there's this constant sort of like uh, never ending battle of you You want to use a tax to, to get people to do a particular thing and you end up using it to fund a very particular purpose purpose but then when you have big shifts in how businesses operate and how people live their lives you suddenly have the, with these weird sort of you know scrambling to try to make up for revenue shortfalls things that uh, can be painful mm, interesting that's weird all right let's move on jonathan what do you got for us yeah so this one was not surprising but a little bit sad that lawrence fishburn in an interview this week confirmed that he is, has not been invited to come back and reprise his character of Morpheus in Matrix Part 4. It's kind of sad because obviously inter integral part in the uh, in the first three films and they didn't bring him out when they announced that they were going to reboot this with Keanu Reeves, Carrie Ann Moss. They mentioned Jada Pinkett Smith was coming back and she played his love interest in the second two movies. And they've announced all kinds of other cast members, but he was definitely conspicuous by his absence and disappointing, I think. It would have been nice to have Morpheus back in there. I don't know if it's necessary to not have him there or if there's other reasons for his lack of appearance, but uh, yeah, kind of sucky. Doesn't he play the father in Black? or something like that or uh grandfather i think he's, he's, in, he's in a sit grandfather he's in sitcom right yeah 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 i don't know changed quite a bit i guess it you know it is what it is it's just it's funny that, to think that they're going to bring back particularly that they're bringing back jada pinkett smith and not him that's odd but uh, you never know how they've got these things planned out but unusual choice and, and i i will say a disappointment 
In other news, Stranger Things. So this one, again, we kind of had an inkling that this was in the offing. There was talk when there was the sort of preview teaser trailer for season four of Stranger Things that they were thinking about this being the last season or that they might do the last season and then do, you know, a little short season or something to wrap it up. But the Duffer Brothers came out this week and uh, confirmed that season four is not, in fact, the end. They said that now that they've had some time, they had to shut down production due to the COVID-19 pandemic and that that's given them time to really sort of think about the future and how they want to do this uh, entire storyline and without the pressure of obviously getting out there and actually making it because there's only so much you can do so they said uh, no they don't think that season four is the end they're going to do more they haven't announced in what form the continuation is going to take so it could be uh, a movie or movies on Netflix it could be a theatrical movie it could be a season five and six who knows but either way we know that that season four is just a continuation and not the end. Cool. All right. Uh, another one, Olivia Wilde has been tapped to direct an unrevealed, untitled, female-centered Marvel movie for Sony Pictures. This is interesting because Sony Pictures, the only rights they own related to Marvel is the Spider-Man characters, including Spider-Woman. So the talk and rumors out there after this announcement is that she may be there to direct a Spider-Woman movie, which which is kind of interesting. Spider-Woman, long-time Marvel character. There have been different Spider-Women over the years that have been around since the 1970s, Jessica Drew's character. And uh, it'll be interesting to see how they go forward with that. There was the other rumor that's tied to this is that there is a possibility that that could loop in the Into the Spider-Verse, Spider-Gwen, young female Spider-Woman character. So, yeah, either way, I think interesting possibilities. I'm way more interested in that than I am some of the more obscure... They're doing a Jared Leto Morpheus movie, Morpheus the Living Vampire, and some of the more obscure Spider-Man villain stuff. I'm, I'm not as wild on that, but a Spider-Woman movie directed by a, a woman could be really interesting. Mm, yeah, because, you know, only a woman would know the Spider-Woman, right? Well, you know what? Any woman behind the camera is a good start, so we'll, we'll go from there. That's true. That's true. <laughs> and this one dro dropped today. This one I found really interesting. So we had found out that Michael Keaton was going to come back during our, our hiatus. Michael Keaton, uh, it was revealed, is going to come back in the Flash movie that is being planned, uh, Flashpoint. Flashpoint is a story that appeared in the comics. It is about how, uh, you know, there's this sort of multiverse of different iterations of characters and Michael Keaton was going to reprise his role as Batman having done that obviously in the first two Batman theatrical movies Batman and Batman Returns in the late 80s and early 90s and that was pretty cool but now we've got news today Ben Affleck has confirmed that he is going to come back for that same film Batfleck the Batfleck is back in the bat beef suit so very interesting to hear that they're going to not just have Keaton reprises his role, but they're going to have Affleck reprise his role. Personally, I'm holding out that we're going to get Clooney and Kilmer in their costumes as well. Yeah, I was going to say, what about Val Kilmer? Yeah, yeah so uh, interesting that they're going this route and that they're going to sort of do these different uh, iterations. Obviously, Keaton's going to play an older version of Batman. Um, it'll be interesting to see if he plays the sort of Frank Miller Dark Knight version, because that would make a lot of sense given his age and uh, how that could be brought to the screen for the first time in live action. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm really kind of curious to see this movie now. I, I had, I think like a lot of us sort of not soured necessarily, but been a little leery given some of the track record of the DC Universe uh, movies. Was a little trepidatious about some of these things, but this movie sounds really interesting. And I love Ezra Miller. I think he's he's really funny and charming. Uh, he's going to be the star as, as Flash as he was uh, in the TV show and uh, or in the TV show, in the Justice League film and then also he appeared briefly in uh, an episode of the flash this season too kind of interesting the flash guy he was the the flash from a different universe in an episode of flash this oh year. i see okay okay i was wondering if the tv show flash would be in this movie but i guess not uh i mean i think they absolutely should i think that'd be fantastic i think if they could meld all that stuff together like you know i, I thought the crisis and infinite earth thing that they did with the tv show was fantastic last year by bringing back lots of familiar faces i i think if you're going to do something that's set on like the multiverse the idea of like different iterations of the same character why not mm -hmm. i still have i still have that on my my back catalog things to watch oh uh, make make it make an effort it's really good 
good. Really good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, for huge, you know, comic nerds like me, it's just it's just a, a treat. But it really taps more into the the, the television movie pro- properties than it does to the uh, to the comic books. It really does sort of hit you where you feel if you've been watching this stuff for 50 years. Right. Cool. All right. Well, we're at that part of the show where we talk about Star Trek. We did say at the top of the show that we were talking about Star Trek. Lower Decks, Season 1, Episode 3, Temporal Edict. And it's my turn to do the recap. And our turn to make fun of you. Get ready, Jaime. And you're, you're, fun, to make, <laughs> you're fun to make Tim of me, yes. All right. Yeah, so it starts off, the show starts off with, with uh, Boimler doing sort of a river dance, you know, violin concerto thing, writing songs about his mom. And uh, he's going to play another song about his mom, but uh, Mariner jumps in with Tendi on drums and they do a, a heavy metal, loud, screaming guitars thing. She says, I don't know what this is called and I don't care. And uh, it's so loud that it's heard throughout the ship and coffee cups are, are rattling and things like that. And Meanwhile, Captain is talking to a Klingon bird of prey is facing them. And uh, he says, what is this? You mocking me with this bass music, you know, and, and, and no, no, it's not, not intentional. And so um, security guy's name is, I wrote it down earlier, but somewhere else Jax. in the story. Yeah. Jax. 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 Like, like, Jax. like, Jax. like one shack, multiple shacks. But more than one shack. <laughs> more than one Shaquille O'Neal is how you can use the two, mnemonic two for that. Two shacks? Okay. Yeah. One two shack, shacks. Shacks. You know, So, so, uh, so uh, you know, Chief of Security, uh, Caddy Shacks, goes down to... Um, to the uh, show just as as Marner st- stepped off and and uh, Boimler's about to go into another rendition grabs his violin and smashes it in half and says you know the captain says you're too loud and of course Boimler's more upset about upsetting the captain than he is about the fact that his guitar or his violin has been crushed so that's the little vignette that starts off this episode meanwhile uh you know we get this this ca- uh, first officer's log as as uh, ransom is reading off his his log uh, talking about how they were heading off to Cardassia Prime, and you know the captain's Captain Freeman. That's her name. Is going to do some fancy, you know, uh, negotiations and things like that. And he goes, "Uh oh, wait, hang on, there's an update." And uh oh, they're not going to be doing that. And so you see her talking to an admiral, Captain Freeman talking to an admiral, and saying that they're not going to Cardassia, and because uh, you know, they're freaking him out, and nobody wants to go to Cardassia. They're going to move the peace talks to Vulcan. And she says, "But I prepared a, 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 a speech, and I've learned the dance." and you know, um, which were left to our imaginations. And uh, she says, you'll get the next to once in a lifetime summit to take care yeah. of, right? So you'll be heading off to Garrick 5 to present them with gifts. And of course, you know, this makes Freeman really upset. She's sitting there talking to Ransom. She says, you know, we don't get, re- we don't get respect. We don't demand their respect. This ship, this ship is a joke. And he goes, yeah, but we're the funniest ship in the, the Starfleet, <laughs> proudly. Anyway, so we flash over to the lower decks where we where our 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 current heroes are, and they're currently testing a the, the force field on a brig. And Mariner fires a, a bolt off of a phaser at Boimler, who's inside the inside the the brig. And uh, he's like, "You almost phasered me." And she goes, "Well, it was on." And she looks at it and she goes, "Oh, it was on stun. Yeah, yeah, that's it. It was on stun." Um. So meanwhile, so so he's a little, little freaked out about that. And uh, and after they're they're done calibrating the 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 force field on the the, the field on the brig, she says she goes over to the replicator and says, "Okay, time for margaritas." And makes four margaritas. And Tendi's like. Don't we report that we're finished and we should go get a new task? No, this is buffer time. We sit back and we kick back and you never tell you never tell them how long things actually take. You always tell them it takes a little bit longer and we call it creative estimating. And you're you're a hero if you get it when I mean, you get it done on time, right? So it's just buffer time, it's no biggie. Uh, Boimler says, you know, if it were up to me, we'd never take breaks, but then again, it's a lower deck tradition, so what can I say? So, and of course, the, over the comm, the doctor comes on and says to Tendi, how, how long would it take you to fix a, a bio, bread, bio bed? And uh, she says, uh, five hours? And uh, the doctor says, excuse me, that's great. You know, same sort of turn that we had last week in the, in the show, right? So meanwhile, the captain's walking through the ship and she's looking at and there's a couple of um, ensigns walking and she's like, can you walk a little slower maybe, you know? Um, and uh, what, and she starts yelling at another guy and, he's, and under his breath he says, geez, there goes buffer time. And he goes, what was that? And he carries on and runs away from her. Meanwhile, Boimler, she meets Boimler in the in the uh, lift, turbo lift on the way to the bridge. And uh, she says, uh, hang on a second. What is, what is this, you know, buffer time that you're hearing about? 
And uh, so, of course, you know, next scene we see Boima really nervously walking up to Mariner because, you know, he's like the cat that, you know, spilled beans or whatever. Anyway, so the they uh, they get a they get a message from from Upper Deck saying that the, the scheduling will no scheduling deceit will no longer be tolerated. Tasks are to be done as mandated by the superior officers, and everybody's like, "Oh, well, how bad can that be?" You know, somebody must have ratted on us. Must have been. And Boimler sitting there nervously, and they're like, and she and Marin says, it "Must be Delta Ship." Yeah, apparently they don't like Delta Ship. And um, Tendy says, "You know, they think they're so much better than us because it's just because they're so much better than us." <laughs> <laughs> I hate people like that. Yeah, we don't need buffer time. We're the best. And then, like, and then the cut scene, everybody's freaking out because they're all like running behind, and the time's running out, and so the, you just see all kinds of sh- scenes for the next couple of minutes of people freaking out, trying to meet their deadlines, and you know, running out of time, and just. Shoving stuff into into corridors and running away. Yeah, so at one point, uh, you know, they're getting ready for an away mission and Mariner's going with, with Ransom and she says, you know, why aren't, why aren't you helping us with all this stuff and loading up the supplies? And he goes, I am helping. I'm commanding. <laughs> right? And he says to her, roll down those sleeves. That's not regulation. Anyway, so she got her sleeves rolled up. So as they're going down to the planet, they're going down to Garrick 5. They're, they're, or is it Garrick 5? I think it's Gelrak. Gelrak 5. Gelrak 5, yes. They're, 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 their mission is to display the honor crystal to, to the people when they meet. And um, and then he says, greetings, it's an honor. And he opens, he tells uh, Vendome. Interesting that one guy's named Vendome and the other one's called Vendor. Mm-hmm. Did they buy a vowel, maybe? Anyway, so Vendome is, is opens up the box and turns out it's it's a lump of wood, which is a fertility token on one of the rival planets. And of course, that you know it insults the uh, insults the, the the people of the planet. You know, have their spears and you know they're they're expecting crystals. Crystals are their their sort of their tenor, I guess. And um, and it leads to the dirtiest line le- leads to the dirtiest line ever spoken in Star Trek. He's got wood. Yeah. He's got wood. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, I didn't write that one down. Okay, all right, I get, it, I get, it, I get, it, I get it, I get it. Okay. All right, so wooden, you know, insulting us with this wooden sex toy from our sworn enemies. This is an act of war. And so they start, you know, throwing things. And one of them spears Vendome and knocks him down. And Mariner, of course, starts, you know, kicking butt left, right, and center. And, and uh, finally gets surrounded. And, uh, you know, they they, 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 they they fall back. And she grabs uh, Vendome. And, and he's like, oh, I've been stabbed. I'm going to die. And she says, we live on a spaceship. Nobody dies from a, from a spear wound. And she wraps up his wound. Of course, you know, Ransom says, I hate when this happens. Yeah. <laughs> Negotiations fall down. Anyway, so yeah, she gets she gets uh, surrounded by uh, other aliens, and they've all got her, like, their spheres pointed at her. She says, what am I, Kirk? Is this the 20, 2260s? Yeah, it's when Rans- Ransom decides he's going to do the uh, the noble thing and, and engage in peace talks and steps out from behind the cover and gets immediately hit in the face and the crotch. And, and thrown with, a, with a, a magnetic net over top of him. He goes, yeah, that was awesome. <laughs> <laughs> he says, this is going to be awesome. And yeah, of course it was awesome. Anyway, so back on the ship, Tendi can't remember where sick bay is and what, what deck it's on. And they're all freaking out because they're all still under a lot of stress trying to run around and get all this, this stuff done. And even the captain who's up on the, she's made the edict around the entire ship, right? So even the people on the, the bridge are freaking out because they can't remember instructions because they haven't got any time to relax or whatever. Uh, so she pushes them aside. Here, move, I'll do it myself kind of thing. And Shax, have you heard away, heard from the away team? And meanwhile, and, you know, he says, well, sensors have picked up a, a Galrakian ships approaching. And, and then they start sending up boarding pods. Um, so she calls up Red Alert and uh, she tells everybody to re- repel, the vi- repel the intruders, but don't stop working. I want to make sure, you know, you're working and you're repelling. And we flash back to Ransom and, and Mariner in a, or in a, like a cage together, like being trapped in there. And Ransom is writing a speech on the wall. She says, what are you doing? I'm writing a speech to convince them to let us go. And, and she says, do you mind if I speak freely? Because, well, nobody can seem to stop you from speaking freely. <laughs> uh, so anyway, this is this is the sort of, I'm going to jump in here and do what Jonathan normally does and say, this is obviously leading towards these two having some sort of relationship. Because, yeah. uh, you know, it's the sort of, you know, opposite to track kind of metaphor that we see in so many of these things, right? And also her, her sleeping with him would really tick off her mother. Mm-hmm. Yep. That's true. Yes. Yeah. So anyway, an, a, a, a leader shows up and says, you know, you're going to have to have trial by combat. You're going to fight, you know, with our one and only Vindor, who's, you know, he says, normally we have this, you know, shadow, you know, huge shadow, and he's super intimidating, but he's here, so I'll just show, introduce you to him. 
And of course, then of course they cut to a scene where you see Ransom and, and Mariner and this big impending shadow, in, intimidating shadow coming over to them as, as uh, Vindor shows up. And then he says, you know, if you if you, you you win, you get to go free. But if you lose, your team will be crushed by an uh, adjudication geode <laughs> and uh, a constitutional crystal that it was used to legally smooth criminals. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he throws them a battle blade for them to fight. And he says, you decide. And so the two of them have to decide who's going to fight. And, and of course, they start arguing with each other about who's going to fight. And he's like, you're fighting over who's going to get chopped in half by Vindor? <laughs> um, but anyway, so we go back up to the ship and, and Boimler is just having a great time, you know, checking off his checklist and you know, he's got all kinds of stuff and he starts phasering off some of the graffiti that the, the enemy has been writing on their wall, all these insults and stuff like that. And uh, and then he starts firing at people and, and uh, realizes that they, 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 you know, they've got spears and he's got a phaser. He goes, oh, I got a phaser. And he starts shooting them. And then he goes up to the ship and realizes that the, sh- the bridge people are also under the same strict guidelines. I know the captain's running around like a mad woman trying to keep up with the, the schedules that she's imposed on ourselves, right? Um, and, you know, the, the, the enemy people are busting in the door going, give us your crystals, give us your crystals. He goes, we don't have any crystals. Well, we do have dilithium, but we're not going to give you any of that. Yeah. <laughs> Those are our crystals. Anyway, so they get back down to the cage where Mariner and and uh, uh, Ransom are doing the, the uh, I think it was Lethal Weapon 3, where um, Rene Russo and, and uh, um, Mel Gibson's characters are comparing scars. Yeah. Uh, so she's showing off all of her scars and all the different battles that she's gotten into and all the scrapes that she's had. And, and uh, you know, you play it safe. You're always just doing this peace talk kind of thing. And, you know, she says, sometimes you have to do what's wrong to win. And he goes, you're right. And he stabs her in the foot with the, with the blade. So Ransom is the one obviously who's going to go off and fight Vindor. Um, and of course, he goes into this, you know, typical uh, kind of, you know, what do you call these things? Coliseum kind of view where the crowd's out there and he's got to fight him. And he throws aside the the, the blade and attacks Vindor with his fists by, you know, the, the, the Star Trek trope of, of holding your two fists together and just clubbing the other person, <laughs> which they used to do in the first series, the original series. Um, and she's she's looking at him. Of course, he's ripped off his shirt. And he's got his all, he's ripped, of course, right? And uh, she's looking at it and she's going, this is actually kind of hot you know and she's like turns around trying to convince herself that it's not hot meanwhile up on the ship the the bad guys are still making crystal graffiti and laughing about it and and then uh she says you know why why can't everybody be like you and she goes well none of you one's a boimler they're only human Mm -hmm. and vulcan and orion and there's that guy in tactical anyway so he says for the good of the ship he's telling captain we have to loosen up and she's you know you're a great captain you know we we need to have some buffer time you got to be a great leader because you're right i am a great captain cut any corner to defend the search yeah it was the opposite opposite of the do everything you know by the book and also specifically in this amount of time and it was like do whatever it takes to to stop this problem yeah yeah cut cut the corners get rid of protocols whatever by the way the name of the space shuttle that they're standing beside in this case is but death valley because they took the yosemite down to the planet ransom ends up defeating um the other guy and uh so they said all right you're all free everybody's free and they, they so they get to go away and they're discussing what they should do instead of having because they never get to use their adjudication crystal so um, they want to, uh, you know, he's disappointed by that. So they talk about maybe having, you know, trials and things like that instead of instead of that, right? Death race. Death race. Uh, go and build a crystal uh, crystal car right now. She comes back. He comes back to rescue uh, um, a Mariner, and uh, he says, she can stab me, but you can't stab Vindor, right? Anyway, he sweeps her off her feet, which is obviously a clue for future things. So later on, they, we see them return back to the planet with a, with the proper crystal, this thing, and the you know, the aliens are saying, well, sorry about the whole invading your ship thing, you know, no hard feelings, right? Yeah, it was very uncrystal-like of us. Yeah, and he, and he says, we'd rather be, and then, you know, Shaq says, we'd rather be here with you than those worship, those wood-worshipping freaks on Mavic Prime. And then we flash back to Mariner, who's in, in the, in the uh, sick bay. Um, and she's a doctor offers to clean up her scar. She says, no, no, these are my trophies. I want to keep them. And she said, congratulations. You look like a scratching post. Mm-hmm. Ransom comes up and says, give me a heads up before you file your report. I want to make sure, you know, stabbing you in the foot is, is a court martialing offense. And, you know, and she says, I'm not going to file a report. And, you know, and of course, you know, he goes, oh, and he's, he's leaning in. It looks like he's, they're going to kiss. And he says, take her away, boys. And uh, sends her to the bricks for not rolling up her sleeves, as he told yeah. me earlier <laughs> in the episode. Right. Uh, and then at the end of it, uh, the captain says, you know, I've decided to give this this new buffer time, you know, people taking their time and to do the job right uh, kind of deal. We're going to call it the Boimler effect. Hmm. And he goes, oh, no, no. Can you not make it like that? They at least have to they have to complete one task, you know, kind of thing. And she says, no, no. And, and he, he goes, is it written down? Is it an ink? And she just hands him a plaque. And he goes, oh, it's on a plaque, right? 
And she says, don't worry about it. No one will ever remember. And of course, we flash forward to, you know, several hundred years in the future. And they're talking about the Boimler effect, which is named after the laziest member of Starfleet, <laughs> Brad Boimler. Next, we'll talk about the most important person in Starfleet history, Chief, Chief O'Brien. Miles O'Brien. <laughs> yeah. It was never any, nowhere near Scotty. But anyway, so that's the recap. O'Brien, not even, you know, when he becomes the chief over on DS9, has, you know, a bit more of a storied career. Uh, it was Chief O'Brien as he was a transporter chief on the Enterprise. And, and it, it seemed like that was a way to, to tip the hat over to Chief O'Brien at work, um, which was a pick a, a long time ago, I think, on, on this very show. So Chief O'Brien at work, all one word, no, uh, no apostrophe. It follows, you know, Miles O'Brien as he's very bored sitting there in the um in the transporter room waiting for people to, to need to be beamed away somewhere oh to come and be transported yeah 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 oh he wasn't even like the end chief engineer no not on, Enter on enterprise he was just the, the chief transporter chief oh wow yeah, yeah. And, and when you think about it like chief o'brien going and becoming you know you know the head of engineering over at ds9 that was when starfleet thought oh this is this backwater area that nobody would ever possibly want to be at so yeah sure fine we'll, we'll let you you know get some experience there and it's only you know by happenstance that oh this actually becomes one of the most critical areas of the whole quadrant given the proximity to the bajoran wormhole so it's funny that you know we were talking we had a, a I was attending a conference yesterday a virtual conference and on uh, tuesday evening we had a, zo a zoom call sort of a get together and have beer and we started talking about star trek and a few other things and because a couple of other people who were on the on the call also have star trek uh, based uh, uh podcasts like g mcdonald does one on Voyager, right? And um, they were saying, uh, I never really thought about this, but they were saying that Deep Space Nine was sort of like Cisco was a good leader because he was the least sort of Star War or Starfleety kind of guy because like St Starfleet was sort of this evil empire kind of thing. And, and yet, you know, the Deep Space Nine kind of ran on a different sort of thread. Do you guys get that impression from Deep Space Nine? I, I think in Deep Space Nine, like he is at the beginning, obviously, he's very uh, angry at Picard and he's angry at Starfleet uh, over the death of his wife. But there is a, like, as he gets more involved in the Cardassian-Bajoran conflict and as he gets more involved with the Dominion conflict, I think his, I think we definitely see some holes poked in the facade of Starfleet is, you know, the true white knights or whatever. We see it more as a, a big bureaucracy and a military organization and all these other things. So yeah, I think that's probably true. Well, did you think this this story was i mean it had some plot advancements but and i guess it had some typical star trek tropes but it was it wasn't nearly as entertaining as last week's show right yeah no i think uh this wasn't as i think flat out funny as last week's episode but as we talked about last week last week's episode leaned really heavily on star trek institutional knowledge on the humor side this i think was a more accessible episode so if somebody wasn't as deep in trek this would have been better for them because there was only a few things there was some good in jokes there was a joke in there at one point when they were talking about going down for the away mission and ransom sort of says you know you never know what you'll find on an away mission uh horned gorilla which is a reference to the magatu in uh in the original series or a sentient tar which of course is the tasha yar death of tasha yar from tng so there's like good little throwaways in there but you don't have to know that to appreciate the funny part of that humor um so i yeah i think i think this one was not as reliant on the Trek side of the humor. It was a little more sort of easily accessible, but it wasn't as funny. And I don't know if that's because we were more rooted in the humor that they were in last week, or if that's just, it just wasn't quite as good. There was lots of good little side jokes. Again, the adjudication geo was really funny. When uh, uh, Ransom and Mariner are talking in the cell and she says, you know, you're only, you know, you only do these things because you're rank. Rank doesn't mean anything. And he says, rank means everything. Always. Like, good lines. Um, she says, you know, I've been to some of the, you know, I have, I can handle myself. been to some of the scariest places in the galaxy. And she starts listing off all these scariest places in the galaxy. And then ends with Scottsdale, Arizona. That was very funny. Um the, when when she gets betrayed by Ransom at the end and he's throwing her in the brig and she says, I'm going to dance in your blood. Like, just funny lines. Lots of funny lines. Again, it's still 
Like, it's not. I don't think this was a bad episode at all. I think it was really funny. But I think last week was, you know, laugh a minute. It was much more... I think the chemistry between Boimler and Mariner really made that episode work. And um, But but as I said, I think it, last week, you know, a lot of the laughs were, you got to know what an, who an Andorian is. You got to know what a Borg is. You got to know, you know, the different things about the different departments in on a starship. Uh, a starship. You know, like, I think it was a little more reliant on this. I think if there was only one joke in this whole episode where uh, you know, I watched it with a uh, number one fan and he sort of, it was the very last joke of the episode where he said, I, I get that I'm supposed to think this is funny, but who's Chief O'Brien? Right. <laughs> Whereas the rest of it was pretty accessible. And, and I love, I loved, I mean, so it's been a joke. It's been an open joke for years. The whole like, you know, Scotty says it's going to take five hours. He's a miracle worker. He gets it done in two hours. Oh, Scotty, you're the greatest. And that whole trope of, uh, you know, overestimate and, or, you know, uh, and then deliver in a, an amazing time and you become the miracle worker has always been part of the Trek lore. And the fact that they entrenched it in the lower decks pantheon of, of ethos, uh, yeah, yeah, ethos of what they're doing. Yeah. Like I thought that was really funny where they're like, you know, yeah, we call it buffer time. It's, you know, it's the tradition of overestimating time. It's funny that they like, that's something that everybody on every ship who works on the lower decks just knows. You tell them it's going to take five hours. It's going to take two hours. They're like, man, you're amazing. And meanwhile, you're sitting there for an hour drinking margaritas. Well, it's like the scene from Alien where um, Ripley comes down to the, you know, the first movie. The Ripley comes down to the two guys in the in the bottom in the bottom, and they're like, "She's like, how long is it going to take to fix the ship?" And they're like, "Oh, it's going to take a couple of weeks." And you know, if we were in dry dock, it would take a couple of weeks and whatever. And uh, and then she walks away, and the one guy leans on the the pipe and accidentally like, turns it off, you know, so the steam stops. Yeah, the same sort of idea that you know you never tell the working guys never tell the the execs or the officers what, what's really going on, you know, kind of thing. I definitely got a lot of like the you have to know the the fandom sort of stuff to get like the you know just how overpowered the the double-handed fist is yeah. <laughs> destroying all your enemies that's definitely a, a star <laughs> trek ism and um i was interested in some of the um you know some of the the stuff that they're laying out for us like you know i, I think we've seen over these past few episodes that you have sort of two different approaches you have the very much by the book overachiever to approach that boimler sort of represents and then you have the go with the flow in in a whole lot less predictable sort of nature that you have coming out of uh and some mariner and i think it's almost kind of saying like you kind of need both right like we've had mariner end up being like very much doing the right thing uh that was necessary even if it was against protocol and i think they're they're setting us up because they've they've talked about how you know she's seen a lot of things and it seems very clear that like she isn't like a normal ensign yes she's got the the family life where she spent time on a ship uh, and and has seen that sort of you know through osmosis through you're just living on a on a starship but i i also sort of feel like well i think she got to like lieutenant or maybe higher and then got busted way down uh so she's kind of slumming it here where she's like i don't want to deal with this nonsense like this this is below me and also you know when you when you go up the ranks you start realizing oh you can't do everything by the book you got to break the the rules but you got to know what those rules are to break them properly right and I think that uh, another thing I'm interested in seeing is, you know, they, they had Mariner talking about the scars and I'm like, oh, another little interesting thing is she had a scar on her chest, right? When when she and, and Ransom are fighting over who's going to get the sword and and, and fight the, the Hulk guy. I, I wonder if they'll give us more detail about that scar because it's a very sort of like non-typical sort of scar to put. And I wonder if it was also a little tip of the hat for, you know, for fans of Star Trek of like, oh, is that a little wink of like, maybe she got stabbed in the heart by a, a Nausicaan sort of thing, right? Like, you know, there's, there's there's other layers and and I'll, you know, second Jonathan's position, like this one is a lot more accessible because you don't need those facts to enjoy it. It's still very on the surface. You can get what's going on, especially because these are, as far as I know, largely creatures that we are uh, species we've never seen before. You don't really need to know, oh yeah, you know, like, that's what Endorian's about. That's what Klingons are about. It's like, these are, as far as I know, unique to uh, Lower Decks creatures. So they, they, I think, did a pretty good balance here of, of making it accessible.
possible, but still continue to have those those winks and nods to people who who really geek out on this sort of stuff. I was going to say that it's really closer to the original series, in my opinion, like in not in terms of bad acting and stuff like that, but like Ransom ripping off his shirt is, is definitely a William Shatner move, right? And I think Mariner is Kirk, right? She's she's a rule breaker, you know, she's she kicks butt, you know, she always, she always references Kirk in, in, in her, her, her dialogues. It's funny, though, I was also thinking, too, like as you guys were talking that, you know, the one thing you don't see in the later Star Treks, I mean, because I found that the next generation was a little bit more stuff, stuffed shirty kind of Star Trek, like, you know, very, very much the, you know, the, uh, what do they call it, the prime directive and all that kind of stuff and, and uh, you know, by the book and protocols and stuff. Like that. And that's partly because of uh, Patrick Stewart's character or his portrayal of Picard. But like, it seemed like Captain Kirk went around sexually assaulting every alien he came across, <laughs> right? You know, like every show, it would be a, a sexy alien or a sexy robot or a sexy, you know, like <laughs> notwithstanding all the, you know, the, the, the important parts are maybe in different parts of the body. But, you know, in the 60s, that was, you know, they, they either had a knockdown drag him out fight with the Klingons or, or what, or the alien were you know at war with them there's so many episodes where they they ended up at you know at odds at war in a fight to the death you know like a mock time and things like that right um they were always getting into those kind of jams and and yet this so this sort of plays off that kind of star trek kind of story you know without the but i mean and they do they do have the like you said they 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 drop the f-bombs and you know she says bull beep at one point and she calls a ransom or ransom's bull beep on something right yeah i mean so i i think i find that like it's very similar to the original Star Trek in terms of like they go on away missions and they mess them up and you know you know it's, I used to think that the original series was always about spreading democracy throughout the universe whether they wanted it or not you know kind of thing in fact there's one episode where they even have the, the bastardized American Pledge of Allegiance if you remember right yeah. and they're praying to a flag and one episode where Nazi where Nazi Germany's taken over and so on and so forth right sort of playing off of Earth history in terms of things but yeah sort of, I, I find that this this sort of you know fight to the death kind of thing is a typical and the double handed fist thing that that was a, definitely a William Shatner move. Oh yeah, yeah, they clamp the fist together and make a powerful club. Yeah, and and uh, Commander Ransom going you know full on groundskeeper Willie from the Simpsons where he's just like unreasonably <laughs> in shape and ripped when his uniform comes off. Yeah, it's funny when uh, when Mariner's looking out there and she's like you know this is kind of hot and then she's like oh no it's gross and then she ends up watching him and she goes mm, so ethical. <laughs> and you would think too yeah like like Jaime said like she would have been raised like her if her mother's in Starfleet and her father's in Starfleet she definitely would have been raised on a ship right like like the Enterprise or something like that right she would have been the Wesley Crusher kind of kid right growing up in this whole thing right yeah and 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 Wesley is definitely more you know personality wise more affinity with Boimler and so we kind of see well what happens if you know if Wesley didn't have a a, a good guiding principle like a Picard to to be there as well what ends up happening if, you know, different parenting and you end up with a sort of a different result for a child who still has all of that same sort of learning through osmosis and, and through experience and less so through through the books, right? And Wesley has a, a whole like pre-career in Starfleet prior to ever going to uh, Starfleet Academy. Well, I was going to say too that in as much as Kirk and the guys would, you know, they, they would go and present the piece of wood to the to the people who are expecting to see a crystal kind of thing. And and yet in, in the next generation, they would like you get in trouble for walking on the grass or for stepping in a tar pit or something like that you know or singing the playing the wrong note on a flute kind of thing yeah i can't wait for the uh the wesley crusher breaking bad coming next year on uh, cbs all access the uh the spinoff it, it, we get the you know what mariner would have been like as a child the spinoff breaking bad in track I also found it kind of interesting that, you know, the, the initial sort of premise was that they were going to Cardassia Prime, which, you know, this isn't that far away from the Dominion War. And it seemed like that was kind of a, an interesting place to go, right? It was, you know, going to be a little bit more exotic. And it's like, oh, it's kind of like, you know, uh, going to Russia or going to Thailand or something. And then it's like, oh, no, actually, th this whole conference is going to be on Vulcan. It's like, dude, that's like in this city right next to us. Like, that's not cool anymore. Like this, this, you know, this uh this job trip sucks now and, and don't worry you'll get the you'll you'll get your shot at the once in a lifetime peace talks you know like yeah like this opera you'll get another opportunity i'm sure you know uh-huh 
We move on to our watch list. Uh, so mine is, uh, it's kind of a half pick, uh, and that's Warrior Nun on Netflix. It's a it's a 10 episode series. I want to say it's based on, uh, on a comic book series, but the, the basic premise is that you have this fight between good and evil, and there is a secret warrior, all lady sect of, of nuns that fight against uh, the demons. And there's the warrior nun that is imbued with uh, powers from a special halo that they use to to end up you know fighting you know fire with fire so to speak against the demons and i i gave it a half pick because it's 10 episodes and i really feel like i didn't really get into the first five episodes and it is kind of a slow roll and then the final five episodes are like actually pretty good and i think it speeds up where it feels like this maybe shouldn't have been uh, a 10 episode series maybe it could have been a, a two-hour movie or like a six episode really tight series uh there's a whole sub like a whole uh teenager subplot that i'm like wow uh, i don't know if this happens in the comic books but like i'm not really sold on this part if that makes sense um so your your, your mileage may vary with this one um but the last half of the season is pretty good and i think pretty well done i just have concerns and reservations about the first half isn't wasn't weren't they warrior nuns in picard like isn't that where um oh yeah the romulan warrior nuns yeah 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 all right what do you got john uh yeah so uh archer we've talked about on the show in the past. Archer is one of my favorite shows. It's so funny. Archer season 11 was delayed due to COVID. It was supposed to come out in the spring. We now have a, a date for it. It's coming out on September 16th and the uh, teaser trailer has dropped for it as well. Uh, for those who are behind on their Archer watching, so uh, about four years ago Archer, the character, was shot and drowned and left for dead in a pool and went into a coma. So the last few seasons have taken place inside of his mind as he is envisioning different scenarios for himself and his friends. So they they don't haven't really happened. They've all just been in his mind. So they did one that was sort of an Indiana Jonesy kind of thing. They did one that was sort of a uh, a crime noir kind of thing. And then they did one last season that was set in outer space where the whole crew was all uh, it was like a little bit Futurama, a little bit alien, and uh, but it was really funny. And so now apparently this season's hook is that Archer is coming out of his coma and is returning to the real quote unquote real world and so it should be really fun to see how they sort of bring back the you know original Archer vibe more of the you know spy agency um, kind of thing that was going on before Um, yeah I'm kind of keen to see what they can make of that and hopefully it will be as good as everything that we've been waiting for it was uh, obviously put on hiatus because of COVID it was almost finished and they finished it up and now it's ready to go Uh, of course it's FXX and states and here in canada you can watch it on uh the comedy channel and that's my pick for this week this is pretty cool i to be honest i didn't realize that there would be a season 11 of archer i uh i was under the mistaken impression that the 10th season was the was the final one but uh this is a really really nice surprise and definitely looking forward to to seeing this I guess that's it for another week. So, Jonathan, people want to get in touch with you. Where would they find you? I'm on Twitter and Instagram as at JPK News. And how many people get in touch with you? I'm on Twitter as at Dev of the Hair. All right. As usual, my name is Tim Mitra, T-I-M-M-I-T-R-A. On the Twitter machine is where you'll find me. So until next time, we'll see you in the future. Bye. 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 You've been listening to the Spotcast Podcast. This is CNN. What's that? Oh, I just thought the James Earl Jones thing was kind of cool. Oh, wrong show. Right. If you want to find out more about the podcast or see the episode show notes, visit the Spotcast website at spotcast.com. You can get in touch with us on the website or follow us on Twitter at Spotcast. If you have feedback or questions, send us a tweet with the hashtag AskSpotcast. If you like the show, please consider recommending us to a friend, writing a review on iTunes, or pledging any amount at patreon.com slash spotcast. You can find details on how to help us on our website, spotcast.com slash sponsor us. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you in the future. previous IT training and say, have you tried turning it off and on again? Save the good stuff for for when Tim gets this sorted. (laughs)
well, this could or, or could not go into the show depending on what happens here, but I looked up Warrior Nun to see if it was based on a comic book, and it is. Here's a uh, Warrior Nun Ariala is a manga style Canadian comic book character created by Ben Dunn and published by Antarctic Press. There you go. Who knew it was a Canadian phenomenon? I, I feel doubly let down by, by both of you guys for, for <laughs> not realizing that. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll wear this one. I, I you know, as the, the resident uh, comic nerd of Canada here, I feel like I've let you down and, and I apologize. That one is not amongst my collection, I'll tell you. Reading the the Wikipedia entry, it's actually, you know, it seems like the Netflix series is inspired by uh, this comic book and isn't following necessarily. So I'm going to blame Netflix for the uh, the disjointed halves of the hmm. season problem. It seems like this is not the comic book source material problem. Weird. Dan Rather on his social feed said, Nothing makes me happier than getting, getting up in the morning and playing fraudster bingo on my trump card <laughs> like, it's like i've got i've got three in a row now well you know the, the ultimate irony is you know who arrested him right no the postal service <laughs> oh for mail fraud was he was he dumb enough to do this through the mail yeah see that's 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 the way you know that somebody's a rookie is like let me tell you if you want to just commit straight up fraud like you do it on kickstarter like all the other people do <laughs> and then nothing happens <laughs> let me tell you about all these kickstarters where people did just the same exact fraudulent thing they just didn't do it over the mail like dummies that is a federal offense with a capital o yeah <laughs> we'll yeah, check back so. in november yeah yeah i don't think it matters what happens it's, it's he's gonna kick up his kick up his feet and whatever oh it's it's always reassuring when we have days like yesterday where his uh his white house press secretary said he hasn't decided yet if he, he would leave if he loses the election I'm like that's not that's not ideal yeah so can he actually i mean you know can he actually stay in the white house if he doesn't want to leave i mean you're asking a game of thrones style question where <laughs> Varys says lord Varys says you know power resides where people believe power resides so kind of depends on whether you know the the military as is being under the commander-in-chief believes that uh, they are the rightful person in power and and whether other folks who might also intervene like a probably a sergeant at arms of the senate or something would decide you know what to do um but you know unless it you know comes to fisticuffs or guns and knives or something like i i don't know how you would remove somebody <laughs> otherwise right normally it's it's done with civility and and uh, you know propriety Gr- grace and class yeah, not, as not, opposed not to this case not in this case yeah not who knows case, what's yeah. gonna happen so get your popcorn ready <laughs> yeah isn't it nice to be on in seattle washington as opposed to washington dc right like just just let me tell you it is you know almost september just go ahead and start stocking up on that popcorn because it, <laughs> it is gonna go real fast <laughs> at your local stores when people realize